Hi, I'm Chris, and welcome to the second video installment of Studio Soapbox. Uh, in this one, which is going to be a very long multi-part one, uh, I'm going to show you how I develop a piece of art, in this case a lobby card for an upcoming Krogan Adventures radio episode. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do um, is open up a previously existing uh, file. A lot of times I won't necessarily have a template when I first start a project. Um, the templates, when I do have a template, it is because I have previously done a project that I want it to mirror. In this case, uh, the lobby card, I already made one for one of the episodes, the first one. Um, and so now I'm going to use this as my template for all subsequent lobby cards. Um, so what I'm going to do is keep the shapes. Um, click the lock so this little decoder ring theater um, uh, logo. I'm going to turn black. And then I am going to make a a little bit of a like a guidelines um, putting in these little black lines here whoops uh, just in order to make sure that I know the space with which I have to work same thing up here and then down here the same thing um, so Although this is sort of, I guess you would call it my bleed, this is going to be my live area. This is where the meat of the image is going to go. Ah. I'm going to wrap them and try and redo this. I'm just going to uh, fill that in and then. I'm going to stretch it down just a little bit because I, I messed up earlier. Okay, um, at this point, I can just throw this out, uh, that layer with the image on it, and now I'm going to delete the middle of this image, and presto, I now have a template with which to work. So the first thing that I'll usually do uh, if I'm working with a single image that's going to have a lot of imagery to it, um, in order to bring the eye to the focal point that is necessary, I'm going to figure out where my, uh, my thirds are. Uh, there's a principle of composition called the rule of thirds, which basically means that when the image is divided up into uh, nine relatively equal parts um, with this into thirds grid that your eye is most going to gravitate towards these points here, uh, where these lines intersect. Um, uh, given that my image will actually be inside this live area, I may shrink that down just a little bit so as to better represent the composition there. But depending on where I put my text, anything that breaks this line, that's going to have to skew it. I'm going to have to eyeball it a little bit. But this gives me a good basis from which to start, uh, to know where I need to put the, the majority of my, my compositional energy. So as you can see, I've lowered the, the opacity down quite a bit uh, to where I can draw on top of this. And I'm going to make a new layer. And now I'm going to start uh, drawing. So I'm going to figure out where my... Uh, my title stuff is going to go, I'm guessing it's going to go over here. So, I'll write the, uh, the Krogan's part. So this one is called Krogan's Prize. Um, that prize is a little too lackluster, so. There we go. Now it better fits the, uh, the, the space there. Um, and I put this over here because I know I'm going to have some image up here. I know I'm going to have some down here. And I want this to be as out of the way as possible. Now, contrasted with the previous lobby card, this is going to be a little bit different because the last one says, you know, presents uh, Benjamin Krogan in 
heart of maple cotton shot. I'm not going to have space above the title to write Catfoot Krogan in Krogan's Prize. Um, so that means I'm going to have to change things a little bit. It'll probably say something to the effect of Krogan's Prize featuring Catfoot Krogan. Uh, just because compositionally, I don't feel like I can permit myself the same, uh, the same format. Um, okay, so I've got the, uh, the title in there. Now what I'm going to do is start hedging in my, uh, my drawing. Um, so I know that I want a peg leg, uh, because my antagonist character, um, this is him here, uh, Don Montero, who's a Spanish admiral, um, he's got a peg leg, you can see, uh, his left leg is a peg leg, and I think that it would be sort of a nice touch to have that peg leg in the foreground, um, along with the arm holding a sword, uh, so you'll have crossed swords, I think that's always a nice touch for a swashbuckly poster. Um, and I'll show Catfoot, the uh, protagonist, and his uh, companions over here. Um, this is going to be a little bit tricky. It would be less tricky if I hadn't lost my, uh, my thumbnails. Um, I had my contact info in the front of the sketchbook, but that doesn't always mean it'll be returned. I'm very absent-minded and have a tendency to leave stuff uh, when I shouldn't, and though I don't know exactly when I lost it, I think it was at the school, but, you know, it happens. Um, so, have the, uh, sort of the ornateness of the peg leg, as well as, that's no good. Um, well, the peg leg part is fine. Uh, this isn't really working towards the, uh, the, to create the volume of the shape that I want. Um, we're seeing it slightly from below, so I'm going to redo that. Fit there. Uh, give it a lot of um, decor. Um, make it as fancy and ostentatious as possible. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of these sort of curved uh, ground planes. Uh, I stole that from Eric Canetti years ago, and I've always been a fan. You can spot it in a lot of his storyboard work. Um, you almost know when Canetti has storyboarded something because there will be this rounded ground plane. Not always, but I, it's one of the tendencies that he has that I really like. Um, and given that my stuff sort of has a, a springiness to it most of the time, um, I, I think that working with a, a flat grid rarely looks good with, uh, with my stuff, so... This gives me the opportunity to bring that sort of cartoony quality to the 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 uh, the perspective grid that I utilize. Um, so I've got his sword hand over here. Um, although I'd like to see the upper hand, the balancing, the 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 left hand counterbalancing, uh, the weight distribution here. I'm not going to have it. But I just don't have space for it. Um, I don't think that's too much of an issue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that leg. I would put it in to see how it would work. Uh, working digitally gives me a lot of opportunities to play with some of this different stuff. Um, okay, so at this point, I'm going to go ahead and work in Catlet. Um, so now I have a sense of scale with which to uh, to work. Um, and Catfoot's costume uh, in this particular story looks like this. Uh, this story takes place 10 years after the events in the graphic novel in which he's featured Krogan's Vengeance. Um, he's put on a little bit of muscle. He, he looks a little more, um, I don't know, a little more in charge. Uh, in the, the, the book, it's sort of the origins of his piracy, and he's, he's very, uh, I don't know what the word would be, um, reluctant and youthful, and so I wanted him to sort of be very much a man in this one as opposed to a young man or old boy, um, uh, as was the case in the in the graphic novel. Um, so I'm going to glance at this while doing the composition, just because the the weight distribution of the character is a little bit different. There's a lot more weight in the in the sleeves and gloves than there were uh, in the design with which I'm most familiar. Um, a lot of these characters change as they age, and so I, I usually. Not always, but a lot of times I have to reference their, their costume changes and silhouette changes. Um, so. There we 
Boom. Now he will have the uh, the counterbalancing hand there. Um, he's also got a cape. That cape, the way that I drew it, uh, really pulls away from the the dynamism of the leg there. Um, so that's no good. So I need to maybe bring it up in this direction instead. There we go. And the hair goes up there as well. Um, we'll have a pirate hat. Okay. So now this sword will go this way. This sword will go this way. Um, and, okay. So I'm fairly happy with how that, uh, that setup is. Um, I do think that it could use a little more um, of the sense of place where they are. Um, so uh, maybe some like Spanish style architecture. Um, here, uh, which I don't have a great deal of practice with. Um, and this will be mostly watercolored and uh, throw some palm trees in there. Actually, I don't want that to um, to block in his hand. I want his hand to continue to have the silhouette value of standing against the sky. So I'm going to lower down where that is, throw some palm trees in there, because now, see, his hand still uh, makes a clear silhouette from the sky. So does this one. It's not sitting directly behind anything, uh, because when you put something directly behind another object, it'll tend to flatten that object out. Um, you, you do want to have some stagger. You want to keep that silhouette value if possible. Um, only downside, it doesn't really feel all that piratey. There's not really a, uh, a sense of water to this. Um, do I put in some other stuff? Something there. Um, well, I have soldiers. I'll throw some soldiers in there. This is, again, very loose. Show them running. Show some more palm trees back there. It doesn't... Uh, you, you don't get a sense of the water. Like, I'm not showing ships in the background, but hopefully the palm trees uh, and the... the uh, the Spanish colonial architecture, you know, indicative of, of the, the... the colonies in the Caribbean that they had around this time period will hopefully still get that, that clear sense of things across. Um... So this is my roughs, my very, very roughs. Um, I'm also going to figure out what else kind of works in here. Um, do presents. Let me make my brush a lot smaller. Presents. Krogan's Prize. Um, featuring Catfoot. Krogan. Starring... Um, who did this? Scott Moyle. Who does the voice of Catfoot. Um, did a fantastic job. And... Greg Taylor. Um, who plays Admiral Montero um, with just scene-chewing aplomb. Uh, now, the difficulty with this is now I don't have any place for the written and directed by. Um, so that's going to be where... Uh, I guess this ground plane comes in. Um, so although I wasn't planning on it, I think there's going to be a necessity of... making... Background black. Um, with that darkness there, there we go. Um, and 
I'll do my written by Rish Schweitzer here and directed by Greg Taylor. Um, so now I think I've gotten the majority of the information uh, that I need in here. It's a little bit on the busy side, but I, I still feel pretty confident that it'll, it'll serve. Okay, now what I'm going to do is lower the opacity on this down significantly. I'm going to drop my opacity on the, uh, the, the rule of thirds thing. Uh, put these two together, combine them and lower the opacity on this. And now is when I'm gonna go in and start doing the details uh, just a little bit more. So I'll lower it down still just a little bit more. And actually, you know what? I don't need that rule of thirds thing at all anymore. Um, so I'll make a new layer atop this one. And the first thing I'll do is, whoops, figure out my, uh, my title here. I try to square the ends of the C's uh, as much as possible uh, when doing this, just so that there isn't a whole lot of negative space on the top or bottom. Um, one of the plus sides of hand lettering is that you really have a lot of control over what the space fills. Knowing there's going to be an O, I'm doing the same thing over here. Not a whole lot of space in between there. I want this text to be as, as blocky and unified as possible. Um, so now the O is rounded over there to fit in and sort of takes almost a straight line over here so that when the G comes into play, it does the same thing. This G is going to be pull a little bit farther to the right at the top, specifically so that it can match up with the A, um, if you can see what I'm, what I'm doing there. Um, same thing with the N. And pulls back a little bit. And then the S. There we go. So I'm pretty pleased with how that Krogan's looks. I mean, uh, I'll clean it up a little bit when I get to the actual art. But that feels pretty good. Um, oh, something that I didn't do that I probably should, um, which is save. I haven't saved this at all. I have a bad habit of not saving, and then when the electricity goes out uh, or when the computer fails or whatever else might happen, uh, I lose all the work that I've done. Um, given that I'm recording this one, uh, that is that would be no good because then I'd have to start all over again with commentary. Um, part two. Okay. Uh, or two, Krogan's prize. Um, pencils, I'll save it as pencils. Uh, you guys aren't seeing the other monitor, which is where the um, the less arty, more technical aspect of things are done, such as file saves and preferences and things like that. Um, okay, so now I'll get in on the, uh, the second bit of business here. Same thing with that. I'm keeping the, the base of that P as wide as humanly possible um, because I don't want all that negative space in there. And the R on here curves over. Prize. Now these are all more or less straight up and down letters. Um, you know, not angles like the, the A, so I don't have to worry about this one as much. Whoa, that's no good. Uh, with things like ease, rather than box them in, I'll just do hard angles um, and cut them afterwards because that'll make things easier. So here's the... Uh, quotation marks, because this is a short story and we like to be grammatically correct. Um, Seeing that these will be my pencils, I'll go ahead and throw some actual guidelines in there for presents. And that is way too big for my pencil to be using here. There we 
we go. You notice I don't even bother with the upper and lower lines. I'm just going to use that again as a guide. Um, okay, so I've got my title in there, and I feel like that looks okay. Um, that's going to be doable. Okay, so now I'm going to do the uh, the, the characters here. Again, I'm going to glance at this uh, this figure. So. Uh, sorry to not talk when I'm drawing. I have a bad habit of getting wrapped up in things. Um, I tend to be a lot slower when I talk. Um, so this is taking probably a good twice as long as it usually would. Um, so then he's got his back there. Does the back have a belt on it? It does not. But I do want to see that belt, because I feel like the belt over the tunic is sort of very swashbuckly. And I want that uh, impression to come across as clearly as possible. He would have a scabber here, but it's just going to get needlessly clunky uh, when drawing it without the sword in it. So I'm just going to pretend that he doesn't have one at all. Um, I might be making this a little on the big side. He's, he's looking a little bit big. Um, I also have a tendency of going of adding quite a bit of mass to the figures when, when going over the, the, uh, when going over a rough. Um, there we go, he's got that nice big neck now. And yeah, he's he's a little bit big, so I'm gonna shrink him down just a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, again, one of the nice uh, nice bits of working digitally. So there's his long hair blowing in the wind, his scarf, and he'll wear a nice little uh, tricorn hat here because this is taking place few years after. When, uh, when Vengeance did, and there's a, a bit of a difference so far as fashion goes. Um, it's got a feather. Throw that feather in there, too. None of that will conflict with this. I'll make sure that's a different color. Actually, no, that's needlessly top-heavy, so I'm going to go back to this. Actually, still shrink it down just a little bit more. Move it up this way. And I'm going to do the hat first because I feel like it wasn't quite working. So then he's got the, uh, the scarf, the hair, got an earring in there. Um, okay, um, again, sorry for being so slow to actually talk on this. Um, it's not my, don't have a great deal of practice doing actual work. It's always usually demo stuff. Um, yep. It's trial, error, trial, error, trial, error. Uh, yeah, I'm not a... He doesn't have a cape at all. Dagnabbit. Okay. Dun, dun, dun!